guys, welcome. I'm really um, excited to be here today. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and I really would like to introduce uh, our special guest today, which is Tim Hawking. And Tim, yeah, please come here. Yeah, and I think just embarrass you a little bit with reading your resume, what you did, because <laughs> so much and I don't want to miss anything. So, Tim is a principal software engineer in Google, at Google, and also one of the co-founders of the Kubernetes project, right? And I think uh, Kubernetes, I guess, doesn't need a lot of introduction in this forum, but for those of you who are not familiar with this, it is a uh, container orchestration. A project right that uh, enabled automation of deployment of application, managing container scale, right, management. Really an impactful technology that really shaped the next generation of technology and enterprise IT reality, as we call it in SAP. And yeah, so he, uh, he works on, is responsible for topics like networking, storage, node, federation, resource isolation, cluster sharing, all the hardcore stuff. And before Kubernetes, uh, he was also working on Google Borg and Omega projects, and before that, playing the boundaries between hardware and software in Google's production fleet. So, welcome, Tim, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. So, I mean, let's start at the beginning. I mean, tell us a little bit about the Kubernetes journey, how it all evolved, how it all started. So, rewind to uh, 2013, before anybody heard of Docker.io. And uh, it's hard to remember those days, right? Um, we were, I was working with the Borg team and uh, working on Omega and Borg at Google. We were working on open sourcing some of our own container technology, uh, which we eventually did. We called it uh, Let Me Contain That For You. Um, and um, we started to catch wind of this Docker thing. It started to make some of the blogs, and people were talking about it on the Hacker News, and it looked really interesting. So we, we took a look at it, and um, initially sort of dismissed it, honestly. It was, it was sort of like a, a poor man's version of what we had inside Borg, but really only like one little component. And we didn't think it would really take off. We were focusing on our stuff. And our stuff wasn't even really, we weren't really even open sourcing it for the purpose of making an open source product. It was really to get um, the kernel community thinking about isolation techniques that we could benefit from. And uh, now, through the course of 2013, Docker just kept snowballing and snowballing, getting bigger and bigger. Um, and towards the end of 2013, we looked at this and we sort of said, we know where this is going. Like, this, this is Borg. It evolves into Borg. People are going to very quickly need all these other things with Borg. We have an opportunity here to sort of talk about the things we already know, which was sort of fun from an engineering point of view, um, and also to, to sort of donate to the world some of our learnings, so you don't have to go through all the, the problems that we went through over you know, 10 years of building board. And so, um, late 2013, early 2014, we played around with a bunch of different ways to sort of bring what we've been working on out, uh, and eventually it manifested in what we announced at DockerCon, which was the, the Kubernetes 0.1 release. Cool. Um, and the adoption is like amazing, right? I think it's one of the open source project with the highest adoption uh, curve I ever seen. And when Tim and I first met was a couple of years ago when SAP started looking into Kubernetes, which was relatively new coming technology. And um, of course since then it was, it's the, we are all in Kubernetes, right? We are using it to um, offer new services and capabilities on a cloud platform and we are part of the founders of open source project like Gardner, which is uh, cluster management services. Uh, but I want to ask you some uh, questions about the challenges that you see. But before this, I really want to, because uh, I saw, I looked at the numbers of the adoption. I want to share it with you. I just want to make sure I get it right. I actually look at the service at the survey called the State of Kubernetes in 2018, and 60% of the companies actually using Kubernetes or testing it today already, and I think it was only open source right in 2014 when you mentioned, right? And what really strikes me is about how this technology tackles complexity, which means 77% of organization, which, hear me out, more than 1,000 developers, or 88% of the companies with more than 1,000 containers use Kubernetes in production. In simple words, it means that this technology really tackles complexity and scale very well, 
I think it speaks volume on the robustness of this technology. Uh, and we know also how many giants align in their strategy with Kubernetes, like AWS and, um, and Azure, and, and we see a lot of um, moves in the ecosystem, like startups getting acquired, like Heptio, and great startups like Robin Game Brown. But I want to hear a little bit more about the challenges, and if you see any problems that need to be solved um, in order to reach maturity of this technology. So one of the things I think that made Kubernetes really successful at the beginning was our sort of um, very narrow focus. Right? When we came out with the first few releases, it was if you are a web app and you have very small scale, then we're for you. And anybody else go away, we want to talk to you. Um, and if anybody remembers, Kubernetes 1.0 supported, does anybody remember how many machines, how many nodes we supported? 100, right? And we thought 100 is a good number, right? Like, there's a lot of applications out there that use less than 100 machines. Seems reasonable. So we supported 100. And man, we took a lot of crap for that. Um, and this is Google, that's 100, right? It's not even, it's not even a test. Um, but uh, we've put a lot of attention into it. And over the next eight releases, we went from 100 to 250 to 500 to 1,000 to 2,500 to 5,000 relatively quickly. Um, and we sort of stopped at 5,000 because we figured, hey, 5,000 is a pretty good number. Right? A, lot of, a lot of applications out there run less than 5,000 nodes. Um, so now, here we are three years later, uh, and we're talking to a new generation of customers, bigger and stronger customers. We're talking to, uh, well, I don't want to drop names, but, but big internet sites that you've heard of and probably used today um, are talking about how do they use Kubernetes. And they say, well, I need, I need 40,000. Right? Whoa, hold, hold on, that's like a whole order of magnitude more than we are now, right? Um, so I think we have some real challenges in um, tackling the, the bigger side of the world. Um, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a classic 90-10 problem, or like 99-1 problem. 1% like of our users are going to need that level of scale, but they actually need it, right? Um, so we're going we're to work on that. We're spending some time on figuring that out, how to, how to grow that up. Um, it's also in the, you uh, see the right word, it's maturity uh, of software governance for enterprises. Enterprise is always the, the, the long pole in these things. They have really strict requirements around policy management, around data integrity management, around delegation and security. Um, and I think these are places where Kubernetes has sort of gotten away with it for a while. Um, and we're growing up now. And you can see this sort of each release, we're iteratively getting new security capabilities and new storage capabilities and new networking and new policy, um, which means that while I agree that it tries to tackle a lot of complexity, it also brings complexity, right? So if you look at the Kubernetes 1.0 API, there were like five resources, five nouns, maybe six. If you look at the Kubernetes 1.14 API, there's something like 75. Right? The API necessarily grows to, to handle those things. So this is itself a problem and a challenge that we're facing right now is how do we not uh, fall into the pit of being everything for everybody? Um, it's a difficult challenge, right? Everybody wants to pull it in a different direction. The vendors want to go left and the users want to go right and the enterprises want to go up and the uh, IoT wants to go down. Um, it's, it's a challenge for the leadership of this project to figure out where we're going, what we're going to do, and more importantly, what we're not going to do. Yeah, and you mentioned, for example, storage and the importance for enterprises. We were in SAP really amazed to see how um, Kubernetes gained ground, for example, to handle more stateful scenarios and everything, all the ecosystem provided on our system, which really um, is interesting to see how a company like Google can really understand enterprise and keep it providing solution around this. Um, yeah, and there is innovation, like amazing innovation every day. I just read today that Airbnb uh, released like a new automation layer for Kubernetes. They're using Kubernetes for 1,000 engineers to deploy 250 services, 500 deployment per day. This is really impressive, the amount of scale and impact. Great, um, so what, what kind of trends do you see when it comes to um, container orchestration and let's say even DevOps as a whole? Do you see any interesting trends that we should uh, look into? The, the trend I see, I guess, really isn't that surprising. Um, it's towards more security. Uh, as people use this in more environments, they're asking about uh, the, the harder and harder boundaries between things. Um, you know, Google obviously has a, a security disposition that may not be appropriate for everybody to take, um, but we do think that it's informed by 
uh, some, some reasonable arguments. And so uh, we're looking at things like uh, GVisor, a project you may have heard of, uh, as you know, how can we get better security while still maintaining some of the benefits of Kubernetes. Um, <coughs> So I think security is, is really one of the biggest, hottest trends right now. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna leave it with security. It, it's challenging to me, I'm not a security person, so, so please don't bring me your security startups. Um, but uh, when I look at what people do with it, and some of the attacks that people have come up with against systems like Kubernetes, it, it really boggles my mind that I, I couldn't have thought about those things, which means we really need the expertise of people who have security conscious. Yeah. Another thing we liked is the, we, we talked a lot about complexity, but actually the simplicity of interacting with um, Kubernetes, like uh, not everyone feel comfortable with kubectl and we see more solution as a just UI or console for that to make it, to increase the reach for more people, which is I think also great for people who are not biggest maven in, in Kubernetes. Yeah, I mean, the, accidentally we've invented a, an API surfing platform um, it's the sort of thing that if you set up to do on purpose, you will never get right, but if you sort of do it organically, then you might get it right. Um, it turns out that a lot of people really dig the, the sort of declarative infrastructure that we built through Kubernetes. Uh, they want to use it for their own stuff. They want to extend it. So we've been putting a lot of energy into the extension mechanisms like custom resources, um, which uh, are neat because they're just like Kubernetes resources. You can't tell the difference from the built-in resources to the extension resources. Um, you can use kubectl, the command line tool, but you can build these higher level orchestration systems and follow these same patterns. Uh, it turns out to be a really powerful way to declare your API. So now we see people using it to build things like switch control fabrics. Who would have thought? Um, great. So let's, let's talk a little bit about open source and the strategic importance for companies. So open source has been there for a while. And it always drives growth impact, but recently there is really a feeling that something changed, and the impact of open source is much more strategic. We're seeing companies just last year, of course, Red Hat got acquired, but also we know um, like Elastic APO is another example for open source lab project. Um, companies around Kubernetes like FTO, we discussed, uh, get acquired, but also companies like Confluent, Data Freaks, doing very well. There is like a feeling that the the, the the power of open source even increased. And I want to ask you, what changed? Like, do you do also feel the same thing? That open source became like a stronger and better RAM for companies and stronger for business model perspective as well? And what do you think caused this change that we are seeing such a big market impact from open source led companies and projects? Open source has been here, I mean, as long as we've had the internet, we've had open source. Now. Even before, right? I mean, much of the internet is powered on open source. Um, I, as a developer, I grew up on open source. I learned to write code by fiddling with Linux uh, and, and hacking on you know, Red Hat 2, uh, when it was all written in Perl still. Uh, anybody remember Perl? Poor um, went out for a brother. Um, this is how I learned to write code. And, uh, and when I came out of school, I joined a startup that was doing open source, I mean, using open source stuff. Um, and this was right around the time that there were all the big IPOs. Remember 2000? just how exciting that year was when Red Hat IPO and V8 Linux IPO and Cobalt, which was my company, IPO. And each of these was successfully like, the biggest IPO the world had ever seen. And each one just got bigger than the next, than the, than the last. Um, and then the next year, the market just dropped out. Right? The floor fell out from under us and we all died. I mean, not died, Red Hat survived. Good, good for them. Um, so, I mean, I, don't, I sort of reject the idea that open source is more important now than it was then. What I think has, has happened is it's moved up. Um, you know, open source has started at the bottom. Like, what are the most successful open source projects 10 years ago? GCC, Linux, GNU, right? The whole framework of stuff. But those things aren't useful. They're not critical things on their own, although you could argue maybe GCC. Um, but what has happened in the last eight to 10 years is open source has moved up the stack. And now you have the Mongos and the Nginx is Nginx this week, right? Big news. Um, so uh, these things have suddenly become critical pieces of the infrastructure, and now you see things like Envoy, which come out of sort of left field and, and are taking over the industry. Um, I, ha I haven't had a day go by when I heard somebody tell me about something interesting they're doing with Envoy. Um, and so I think this is where it started to be strategic, is, is suddenly it's, it's visible. It's not just infrastructure, it's not just the, the plumbing beneath the systems, it's the systems. Right? These are the building blocks of people's distributed apps today. Um, 
and like to a first approximation, every app is distributed. Every person out there who's fiddling with their phone is using a distributed app, and you're the client talking to some server which has a million backends that has Redis's and, and Mongo's and whatever, they're powering the whole thing, and 85% of that stuff is open source. Yeah, and a natural follow-up question is about the importance of community. And I think Kubernetes has an amazing community. I, I, would, I wouldn't say cult-like community, but it's amazing to see how the community is being managed and it's like best practice. And I can tell you a secret that when we look at strategy and making a decision about picking a project, right? So, and this was also based on our discussion a couple of years ago, we're looking for data, right? I mean, we don't only follow intuition and how things are great. And one of the things you can analyze is the Apache commit, how many commits, the committer trends you have and the movement among the community. It's kind of help you to gather data, whether a project will be centralized, will grow. Let's give you another data point. So back then we saw how the community trends are exponentially bigger than other, I'm not going to name other projects, but, but other projects out there. And I wanted to ask you about um, the Kubernetes community. First of all, how big is it? If you know the number of committers and folks in GitHub, any statistic you can give us. But also, how you maintain and build such a community? How do you engage with them? This is very interesting for me. I, I firmly believe that the Kubernetes community is the reason it's successful. Uh, and if the community had not taken off the way it has, then the project would not have taken off. Um, I absolutely believe that in my wicked little heart. Um, we got up on stage at KubeCon in, in uh, December and we talked about this a little bit. Um, I, I'm not sure I can say how we did it. Like, right place, right time, right attitude. Um, one of the things we went into the community effort with was this idea of radical openness. Right? It wasn't going to be open source in the sense of, here's the code, you can take a look if you want to, but go away, we're not taking your patches. Um, it was not even open source in the sense of, we'll take your patches, but it's still ours. This was, we're giving this to the world, and we are going to actively work to reduce our importance in the project. And we knew that that was important to the success. Right? This was the, the fuel that gave us escape velocity. And um, we can see this really early on. I mean, the, the, fifth or sixth committer to the project was a non-Googler, right, Clee, uh, who went on to be one of the most prolific engineers I've ever met, um, and, uh, and has had massive impact on the system, and, and him and all the other Red Hatters, too. Um, they were in way before 1.0, and uh, that level of openness, I think we really showed them, we're willing to let them have some control over the system, we're willing to hear their ideas and mutate the design in fundamental ways based on their experiences and their feedback. Um, and uh, I think that permeates through the community and people feel like when they approach our community that they can actually have meaningful impact um, and regardless of who they are or where they're from, uh, we've done a lot of um, olive branches for uh, various cloud products. I mean, I work at Google, right? Um, but Kubernetes is a, is a global project and we have contributors from Amazon, we have contributors from Microsoft, we have contributors from IBM, we have contributors uh, from Huawei and from the other Chinese clouds. Um, you know, it really is a global project. The last I looked, the total contributor count was something like 25,000 contributors uh, and something like 2,500 active monthly, um, which is pretty amazing for an open source project. Um, we have contributors from every time zone, uh, and I uh, still haven't gotten an answer to this. Is it every continent or every continent except for Antarctica? Um, so we're trying to figure out if there's one contr contribution that's come from Antarctica. Uh, so somebody who's down there should please uh, send, us a, send me a patch. Um, so how do, and how do we maintain that? Uh, you know, tools like GitHub sort of fall over at a community of that scale. Um, there's a reason that the Linux kernel doesn't use GitHub for this. They use email, which is an entirely other conversation. Um, but we had to invent a bunch of tools to work with GitHub and community at this scale. Right? So we have our own um, uh, uh, automation system we call Prowl, which is built around GitHub triggers and, and actions. It's what lets you interact with the Kubernetes repos. You know, anybody can come to a Kubernetes repo and start interacting with our robots through commands. Uh, and you can open issues, you can get advice on issues, you can have the bot label things for you. You can reach other contributors through the, through the mechanisms here. Um, we built our own submit queue so that all these changes get merged in and tested before they get automatically merged. A human never merges anything in Kubernetes. In fact, if a human merges something, an alert goes up on our Slack channel right, that says, Tim just merged something. Uh, and people question you, like, what 
the hell are you doing? Why, why did you do it instead of letting the bot do it? Um, so you know, we've spent a huge amount of time um, sort of what, we, what Google calls an engineering productivity of making it easier for people to work. We have a great SIG in the community space called Contributor Experience, or ContribX. Um, it's an amazing group of people whose focus is solely on making it easier for people to contribute to the project. Um, and I put a lot of success sort of on them. You know, it's very interesting because um, while you were talking, I was thinking also philosophically about how software can bring the people together because you and I just talked before about we both have some art background. I can tell you, the only reason I'm in tech, I went to music school. I wasn't a good enough musician, so I find myself in tech. Right? And then I continued to engineering school. But it's interesting how open source, open source and software can bring people from all around the world together. Right? This is something uh, which is also nice in the, in the metaphysical level, if I may. Um, and back down to Earth, so you also have an amazing network of partners around us, and one of the notable collaborators you have is the Cloud Native Computation Foundation, right? Which has noticed they are taking more and more um, participation, of course, in, in, in Kubernetes, uh, code development, certification of partners. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do with this organization? So the, the CNCF was founded um, sort of to be a home for Kubernetes. We knew from the beginning that it couldn't be a Google project. If, if the GitHub for Kubernetes was slash Google something, then it would be dead. It would just die on the vine. So we had to have a neutral home for it. And we went sort of talking to foundations, we talked to Apache, we talked to Linux Foundation, and we were trying to find some place that would capture what we thought was the next wave of, of software. And we didn't want it to be the Kubernetes Foundation because we, we wanted it to be bigger than this. We wanted to capture a certain ethos. Um, and so cloud native became the term that we sort of latched onto. So CNCF was founded um, as a sort of a sub-foundation of the Linux Foundation. Um, and Kubernetes was the first project to graduate, but it is not the only project now. We've had projects like Prometheus and CoreDNS, uh, and we now have ContainerD, uh, and there's you know, 15 other projects that are being hosted uh, under CNCF. And what does CNCF do for us? Uh, they do all the things that it's not really possible for developers to do, right? They're gonna run our conferences, right? KubeCon is a three times a year conference. We have US, Europe, and Asia. Uh, the Europe conference is in May. Anybody who wants to go to Barcelona, um, uh, I think tickets might be sold out, um, but uh, you can give it a try. Um, it's gonna be huge. Our, uh, the KubeCon in Seattle was 8,000 people, and Barcelona's gonna be bigger than that. Um, I could never run that. Right? A, a community of engineers on their own could never run something like that. It needs professionals. And so this is what the foundation really gives us, is those sorts of things. Marketing, the, running the programs for things like conformance and certification, running training programs so you can all go out and get your certified, certified Kubernetes administrator badge. Um, those sorts of things uh, give us a scaffolding to run a project and focus on the things that really matter, which is the tech. Great. Um, yeah, and Michael, you should get me a ticket for GCP Next right now that it's sold out. Uh, Michael is leading our engineering works for Google SAP partnership, but not surprised that those events are getting sold out very quickly. So maybe last question regarding the open source chapter. Um, we talked about the importance of community and open source becoming more strategic. What would you advise for other organizations which are not that open source first um, um, to take out of it? Any, anyone who's not figuring out how they can use open source uh, is missing a huge opportunity right now, right? Uh, the software is, is good, it's, like, it's really good. The, the quality and the, the competency of the open source world is, is incredible right now. Um, uh, in fact, it's, it's sort of almost like borderline fictional. Like, if you wrote this in a movie that a, that a community of people would give away their life's work for free in order to make the world a better place, you probably wouldn't believe the plot, right? Um, but here it is. Now that's not to say that open source people are doing it purely out of uh, magnanim magnanimity. Uh, they are doing it because they can build businesses on it. You see companies being founded and, and big companies making big money, um, but they are in fact giving out this stuff to the world. So uh, if you're an enterprise or if you're a startup, you have to be looking at open source, right? You, you can't go rebuild things. You can't go build your own database. You can't go build your own Redis. Even though it's simple in concept, I'll tell you what, the details are going to kill you. And um, strategy-wise, you know, look at open source, look at how to benefit from it, but also look how to give back to it. Because the, the employees that I find that are happiest 
are the people who get to uh, not just work on their products and their projects, but they get to work with a community of other like-minded developers. They get to take the things that they've learned and give that back. And uh, that touches something you know, deep inside of a lot of people. Um, and that doesn't mean that as a, as a company you need to give away your work. I'm not telling you you have to open source your stuff, or even that you should. Um, I'm saying that if you use Redis and you find a bug, pay a developer to go fix it. Right? Give, them a, give them a couple of weeks to go track it down and contribute that thing back upstream. Right? Unless this is part of your core competency, part of your strategy, like, it actually hurts you more to hold on to this stuff than it does to let it go. Thank you. Great advice. Um, good, so let's talk about the future. And we share with us about Kubernetes challenges and kind of next steps. But if you're looking more toward the future, the roadmap for Kubernetes, where do you see this in three years and five years? Three years I can go, five years I'm not sure. We haven't even been around five years. Uh, I'm just now starting to see job racks that say five years of Kubernetes, and there's about 10 people in the world who can claim that. Uh, uh, three years from now, I think, uh, I hope that we will be delivering on the focus that we're on right now, which is um, bigger.